This is Mary's room, um, her toys. This was Eddie, who she'd had from being about five, and he went everywhere with her, every hospital visit. A child's bedroom, lovingly maintained, where memories mean everything. It belonged to Merrin Crofts, seen here on the left, dancing to a video game with her older sister, Amy. <laughs> Having fun featured large in Merrin's life. She was, she was just so happy and bouncy, it describes Merrin. She just bounced into a room. She didn't walk anywhere, she bounced. Um, she was just full of love, full of love and happiness. <laughs> Sometime after this was filmed, Merrin had glandular fever. A viral infection can often be the trigger for ME. At 15, Merrin started to feel weak and breathless. Within six months, she was using a wheelchair. Within a year, she was housebound. Eventually, she was diagnosed with myalgic encephalomyelitis, or ME, also known as chronic fatigue syndrome. I would lie on the bed with her. I couldn't hold her because she couldn't stand physical touch, it hurt her. I had a way of lying on the bed with her where she would kind of put her, her face into my chest here, I would lie alongside her and put my arms around her so they weren't touching her. And when she was in that pain, it was just horrific. Despite such acute pain, some doctors were still reluctant to accept that Merrin had ME, according to her mother, suggesting instead it was all in her head. She says she even came under suspicion herself. Social workers were told to visit the family's house following a safeguarding referral. Well, they suggested I was harming Merrin, basically, and making it all up. Um, they said um, I wanted her kept in a dark room. When I'd explained why the room needed to be dark, they said I spoke for her. When we'd explained why I needed to do that, I had a big file of stuff uh, about ME. And that was used against me. That was used as part of a safeguarding referral. Claire says nothing ever came of the referral. Merrin spent her last three years bedbound and had to be fed through a tube. She was just 21 when she died, one of only two people in the UK to have the cause of death recorded as ME. For Merrin, she'd been told this was in her head and she'd doubted herself and... this monster that was ME had just devastated her life, all of our lives. So it was a, va a validation of, of everything that she'd been through. Merrin was the most severe of the severe, according to her mother. It's not life-threatening for the vast majority of the 250,000 people estimated to have ME in the UK, plus more than a million people with long COVID who have ME-like symptoms. But 80% of sufferers are unable to work and 25% unable to leave their house or even get out of bed. There are some fantastic doctors who are very supportive but there are still many that aren't, who disbelieve the illness, don't understand it, or don't refer to the clinical guideline that exists. What impact can that actually have? Suicide risk is very prevalent in this um, community. It's six times higher. So I would say to doctors that actually ME takes lives and you need to take it very seriously. Staff at the Goldbourne Clinic in Wigan do take ME seriously. As well as 300 ME patients, they're also treating another 300 with long COVID who have ME-like symptoms. OK, how are you, Ms. Moby? I'm OK. I'm I'm lovely doing seeing right. you. Nice to see right. you. Right, so well, tell me about the last year, how things been going? Um, not, not brilliant. Um, I'm getting frustrated because doing just the slightest mm. thing, I'm just absolutely exhausted. Gaynor Moby has a review with an occupational therapist and a consultant. Diagnosed 15 years ago with ME, she's now had to give up her job. A bad day would be sort of just absolutely exhausted, not being able to sort of struggle to get your head off the pillow in the morning, just unable to think straight, unable to, you know, some days sort of clean your teeth, you know what I mean, or, you know, um, having a shower. Too exhausted to even clean your teeth, 
It might be shocking to us, but it's something Dr. Geber hears often. And he has a message to those medical colleagues who still doubt that ME really exists. We don't know how to cure many conditions, but that doesn't mean is that this condition doesn't exist. We don't know how to treat dementia. We don't know how to treat probably 90% of neurological condition. But do you accept quite a few people with ME have been told that by medical professions? This doesn't really exist or it's all in your head. It's very sad and of course it, it needs to be challenged and, and it's very, uh, in my view, very damaging uh, 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 to the patient. Since the pandemic, half of the two million people diagnosed with long COVID have developed ME-like symptoms. Campaigners hope the big increase will be a game changer, forcing the government to increase research funding and finally dispelling the myths about ME. The government has a moral duty to take urgent action for people with ME and people with long COVID. In response, a spokesperson for the Department of Health and Social Care told us We've been consulting on a cross-government ME delivery plan for England, which will include an expansion of research, improvements to services, better education of professionals and a plan for improving attitudes to the condition within the health system. As far as Merrin's mother is concerned, any such changes are long overdue. First and foremost, she wants a sea change in attitudes within the medical profession. I don't think anything will ease the pain of losing Merrin, but something good can come of our hopes that something good would come of her getting Emmy on her death certificate, that no one else has to go through this. And it's too late as I'm saying that because people are going through it right now. But it remains unclear when the government will publish its action plan to address that very issue. Well, joining me now is The Times reporter Sean O'Neill, whose daughter Maeve died in 2021, aged just 27, after suffering with severe ME. Thank you for coming in. When you see how Merrin and her family were treated, does that ring any bells with you? It's incredibly familiar. Uh, our family went through something very, very similar and difficult hospital admissions, uh, neglect, stigmatisation, disbelief, uh, resulting in, in death. Um, and Maeve was a, a vibrant, intelligent young woman whose life was just slowly taken away a bit by bit by this awful disease that medicine doesn't really recognise or understand. When you say disbelief, what, what would they say? Well, I'll give you an example. Right at the end of her life, um, we had to fight for palliative care for Maeve because there were people involved in the kind of bureaucracy that grew up around her that people who didn't believe that ME was a real illness, that they thought it was a fabricated illness or a mental health problem. Um, that persists uh, since I started writing about ME and writing about me, the number of people who have contacted me to say exactly the same thing happens to them. Uh, they, they get referred to social services, there are safeguarding investigations, uh, there are th people are threatened with having their children taken away from them. I mean, when you say fight for palliative care, are you saying they didn't believe she was in pain? They or? didn't believe she was... She had a physical illness. They believed it was a mental health problem. Now, when Sajid Javid was the health secretary, he announced this change in attitudes. He said, you know, the medical system had failed ME sufferers, but he revealed that this was partly because he had a relative who had ME. He had, in the phrase, lived experience of it. He had a member of his family who, yeah, who had it. But, of course, he then went... Yeah. ..and... Well, the momentum was lost with him, but there is a team of people who have come up with an interim delivery plan some months ago. So we're waiting for that to become a, an actual delivery plan. But I think, to be honest, the, the bigger problem is, is not what's going to be written down on pieces of paper or government policies, because we have a nice guideline that was reformed that is still not being implemented properly across the country. The biggest problem, as Merrin's mum suggested there, is the attitudes and the culture within the NHS. There is, there is a, a disbelief, a, a culture that says ME doesn't exist, it's all in the mind, it's a psychological problem, not a physical illness. Even though there's a growing body of evidence that this is post-viral illness, that, it, that somehow viruses, severe viruses, be it COVID or glandular fever or Epstein-Barr or other viruses, affect people's bodies differently. Some people 
just don't recover in the way that most of us do. And I think that figure of 250,000, that's been around for 10 years. The, these figures are way out of date. We, we're, we're lacking research, we're lacking momentum, we're lacking initiative. And, and we really have a massive cultural problem uh, within the medical profession, uh, uh, hostility towards ME. And it's been a tremendous lost opportunity in a way, hasn't it? Because you've got all these hundreds of thousands of people with long COVID, yeah. which is similar, apparently, in terms of the way sufferers experience yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that condition, and uh, no research. There, there is research, but it's, it's minimal. Compared to other conditions, it's very, very small, the research that's put into ME. And there really could be an awful lot more. There is a huge body of people, especially since COVID, and we, we heard a lot of talk of research into long COVID, uh, you know, after the pandemic, but it, it doesn't seem to be continuing. I think that that funding has dried up, so that initiative has dried up. And so what, what I mean, if the problem is attitudes, what, what do you want to try and change that? I mean, do you think it's something that could be changed quickly? No. Because attitudes traditionally take a long time. It, it's going to take time, but there is movement. So uh, there's going to be a, a, an inquest in July into my daughter's death. And we're seeing from the hospital where she was treated, where we, we, we'll find out more about how she was treated at, at the inquest. But we've had a statement from the medical director of that hospital saying that um, there is no inpatient provision anywhere in the NHS for people with severe or very severe ME. And he adds in that statement that this must be tackled at the very highest level. Now, I think that's a very constructive attitude from a, a hospital that could be taking a defensive stance. So I think we're starting to see and starting, I hope we're starting to see the recognition that ME is a real physical illness that really damages people, destroys families, and that hopefully Maeve's inquest will produce some sort of concrete spur to action that, that, that is lacking so far. Sean O'Neill, thank you very much indeed for coming in.